Don't miss any of it. All you have to do is download the Spotify app for free and search cults. Give it a follow and start enjoying. That's it. And did I mention it's all free? Thank you so much for tuning into Cults each week. We look forward to seeing you exclusively on Spotify starting August 2nd. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic violence and sexual abuse that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. It was past midnight, but the 13-year-old girl couldn't sleep. As she lay awake, she heard quiet footsteps making their way down the temple's hallway towards her room. To her, every footfall sounded like the crash of thunder, signaling an oncoming storm. But maybe tonight, it would pass her. There it was, the knock. She had been chosen again. He stood in the doorway for a moment, his white robes glowing in the moonlight. The girl knew she should count herself lucky. Not everyone received Yahweh's blessing the way she did. Many of the other girls were jealous of the attention she received from him, but they didn't understand the toll it took on her. Yahweh's favor wasn't free. To get it, she had to give him her soul, her mind, and her body. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults, a ParCast original. Every Tuesday, we look at a cult's practices, their leader, and their followers. Today, we're continuing our deep dive into the nation of Yahweh and its dangerously charismatic leader, Hulon Mitchell Jr. Last week, we charted the spiritual evolution of Hulon Mitchell until 1979, when 44-year-old Hulon established the Nation of Yahweh in Miami, Florida. This week, we'll follow Hulon's journey as the Nation of Yahweh became one of the most prominent religious and civic organizations in Miami, but one hiding an incredibly dark secret. At ParCast, we're grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help. We also now have merchandise. Head to Parcast.com slash merch for more information. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults as well as all of ParCast's other shows on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. In May of 1980, four white police officers were acquitted for fatally beating a black insurance salesman named Arthur McDuffie. The verdict ignited long-simmering racial tensions in Miami and set off three days of violent riots. Most people saw the riots as a terrible tragedy. For Hulon Mitchell, it was an opportunity to grow the nation of Yahweh. He had established the religious organization in 1979, although the recruitment process had been arduous. But all that changed after the riots. Many people in Miami's black community were attracted to Hulon's message that God's chosen people were black. It gave them a new sense of hope. Vanessa's going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. It's not surprising that people turned to the nation of Yahweh as a way to express themselves after the riots. According to Dr. Kelton Rhodes of the University of Southern California, cults provide a myriad of solutions, which are more importantly accompanied by structure, authority, and close social contacts, elements that people want, need, and which most of us take for granted in our everyday lives. In the nation of Yahweh, people found that sense of community, structure, and empowerment. And Hulon provided the authority. He told his followers that they needed to stand as a single unit against the evil that was white society. Using verses from the book of Acts as inspiration, he proclaimed, We move like one, 
We look like one. We dress as one. We act like one. We talk like one. We love like one. We are one. To visually distinguish themselves, the people of the nation of Yahweh wore white robes that went all the way down to their feet. He said they were holy robes that mirrored God's own clothing. Hulan also required his followers to undergo strict lifestyle changes. To truly love themselves, they had to live by God's rules. According to Hulan, that meant they couldn't smoke, drink, or do drugs. They couldn't gamble or go see movies. They had to abide by a strict diet, which was a modified version of kosher. But the most important rules had to do with sex. First, sex with people outside the nation of Yahweh was forbidden. And if they were going to have sex, it had to be for the purpose of procreation. He encouraged his younger followers to start having children the moment they hit puberty. As Hulon put it, it's not about falling in love, it's about multiplying. In order to grow the tribe, birth control, vasectomies, hysterectomies, and tubal ligations were completely forbidden. However, Hulon kept quiet about the fact that he had gotten a vasectomy himself after his first divorce in 1958. To further unify his followers, Hulon took a page out of the Nation of Islam's book and bestowed them all with new identities. They all took the last name Israel as a way to show their common heritage. They were also required to take new first names, which they could select from a list of names from the Bible. As their leader, Hulon took on the name Moses Israel. With the swell of new members that joined the nation of Yahweh after the McDuffie riots, Hulon was able to collect significant amounts of money from their monthly donations. By December of 1980, he had collected enough tithes from his followers to purchase a 15,000-square-foot warehouse in the predominantly black Liberty City neighborhood. He proclaimed that it would be their nation within a nation. After cleaning up the warehouse and giving it a fresh coat of white paint, Hulon asked his followers to move into the temple. He wanted them to live communally, away from the corrupting influence of society, and completely dedicate their lives to God. At first, Hulon's followers resisted. They weren't ready to give up everything they had to serve God. But Hulon refused to accept their hesitation. Citing the book of Matthew, he admonished his followers. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. About 30 followers buckled under Hulon's pressure and moved into what was dubbed the Temple of Love. It had everything they needed, a cafeteria, a laundry room, an infirmary, a grocery store, and even an ice cream parlor. The followers would never need to leave. They could serve Yahweh all day, every day. They definitely didn't have much time for anything else. Temple residents were expected to rise at 5 a.m. and spend their time praying in between a grueling schedule of household chores and missionary work. To make sure they didn't shirk their duties, Hulon established a small security force called the Circle of Ten, named after a verse from the book of Exodus. Quote, and Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. Armed with five-foot sticks they called staffs of life, the ten were encouraged to discipline anyone who wasn't giving their all to Yahweh. Only Hulon's most trusted followers could join this exclusive force. Soon, the Circle of Ten was responsible for security outside the temple as well. They scared off drug dealers and ran down petty thieves. It didn't take long for criminals to learn they should keep clear of the nation of Yahweh's wrath. In between frightening petty criminals, Hulon's followers were expected to go door-to-door -door throughout Dade County, spreading his message and selling merchandise. Pamphlets went for $5. A customized King James Bible with pictures of black saints and prophets could be had for $25. The grassroots efforts worked. By the spring of 1981, 45-year-old Hulon attracted over 500 people to his Saturday morning sermons. They loved him for his fiery rhetoric about demanding respect from the white establishment. During his sermons, he loved to shout the refrain, I'm not leaving America until you turn Fort Knox over to me. 
At first, all he asked from his new followers was a 10% tithe of their earnings. But soon, new recruits began to face pressure from the followers living in the temple. If they could give up their whole lives for Yahweh, surely the part-timers could afford to give up a little more. Hulan always maintained that donations were strictly voluntary, but there was a price to pay for those who didn't give everything they could. If part-time followers skimped on their donations, Hulan predicted they'd be visited by death and disaster. He wasn't any kinder to those living inside the temple. Hulan was obsessed with making his followers obey his rules when it came to sex. For the men, he conducted regular genital inspections to make sure their penises were clean. When new initiates moved in, Hulan presided over their mass circumcisions. Many were conducted by his 12-year-old nephew, Anthony Solomon, a.k.a. Joshua Israel. For the women, Hulan personally took charge of monitoring their health, but his examinations were anything but medical. During one of Hulan's weekly midwife classes, a follower named Lloyd Clark could hear his wife laughing and screeching. Lloyd worried that something sexual was going on between her and Hulan. He was right. It wasn't just with Lloyd's wife. Unbeknownst to everyone else, Hulan was sexually involved with almost every female in the temple, including girls as young as 10. At first, Lloyd tried his best to stay loyal and not make waves. He had joined in early 1980, making him one of Hulan's earliest devotees. As such, he hated to question his holy leader. But eventually, he reached a breaking point. One day in the temple cafeteria, he heard his wife confide to a friend how much she loved well-endowed men. And Lloyd was ashamed to say that didn't apply to him. He was certain she was talking about Hulan. Unable to contain himself, he confronted her in front of the whole congregation. He called her horrible names, causing her to run away in tears. That night, Hulan called everyone to an emergency meeting. Lloyd suspected that he was in trouble. He was right again. In front of the whole congregation, Hulan singled Lloyd out for his outburst in the cafeteria. He shamed Lloyd for being so focused on sex. Additionally, he scolded him for temple violations, like sleeping on guard duty and leaving his clothes in the dryer. As punishment, Hulan ordered all the women to strike Lloyd in the rear with a wooden paddle. By the end of it, he was in so much pain that he fell to the floor and cried for a half hour. Hulan had used a control tactic that Kelton Rhodes identified as the hot seat technique. In this strategy, individual cult members are singled out in front of the others and forced to admit their weaknesses. It lowers their self-esteem and, as a result, makes them more malleable to a leader's influence. While Lloyd's punishment put him back in his place, it made others reconsider their loyalty to Hulan. They'd been attracted to Hulan's powerful presence, but now they realize that his demand for unwavering loyalty wasn't just talk. Eric Burke, known as Yakim Israel to his fellow Yahwehs, started questioning Hulan's teachings. Lloyd's public paddling made Eric take a second look at the principles Hulan preached. He began to feel like he had joined less of a black empowerment religion and more of a white hate cult. Eric was uncomfortable with Hulan's views on sex and was worried that his donations weren't going towards helping the black community. Although he wanted to have faith in Hulan, Eric couldn't bear to keep his concerns to himself. He asked the temple's bookkeeper, Carlton Carey, a.k.a. Michelle Israel, if he knew where the donations were going. Carlton had no idea. He only kept track of the money that was coming in. Hulan took care of the money going out. Carlton trusted that their leader made sure that the money went towards helping the black community. But once Carlton admitted he had no idea where the money really went, he realized he could get in serious trouble if the IRS ever audited the temple's finances. He decided to ask Hulan for access to the accounts in the summer of 1981. But instead of answers, he was met with anger. Hulan refused to tell Carlton where the money was going. Frankly, he was insulted that Carlton was questioning him. Luckily, Carlton didn't receive any punishment for confronting Hulan. But his doubts remained, and it turned out that he wasn't the only one with questions. 
Carlton's wife, Mildred Banks, was concerned as well. When she first joined the Nation of Yahweh, she found comfort in Hulon's teachings about black prophets, but she was growing uncomfortable with his increasingly violent rhetoric towards whites and non-believers. Led by Carlton, Mildred, and Eric Burke, a small group of dissidents secretly met to discuss their grievances against Hulon and the Nation of Yahweh. They did some digging and learned about Hulon's past. They found out he had left the Nation of Islam after being accused of sexual improprieties. They discussed the possibility of leaving the Nation of Yahweh. Most of them no longer wanted to be associated with a man like Hulon. But they'd never get the chance to escape. Within weeks, most of them would be dead. Coming up, Hulon sends a message to anyone who questions his authority. Hi, it's Vanessa from Parcast, and I'm here to tell you about my new 10-episode limited series, Obituaries. They're some of the most iconic figures of all time, celebrated in death for their individual achievements and impact on society. But in life, the relationships they kept tell a different story, one of unexpected connections that yielded extraordinary change. Every Wednesday on Obituaries, join my co-host Carter and me as we explore the shared legacies of prolific pairs from the past, from the mutual traumas of entertainers Marilyn Monroe and Ella Fitzgerald, to the unlikely admiration between visionaries Mark Twain and Nikola Tesla. Each episode of Obituaries digs deep into the lasting impressions made between two legendary figures and how their entanglements changed the course of history. These meaningful duos may have passed on, but the profound effect they had on each other and us will live on forever. Follow the Spotify original from Parcast, Obituaries. Listen free only on Spotify. Every so often, something so impactful happens, it has the power to capture the attention of a whole country. An event so deadly or dumbfounding, it has no choice but to live on in infamy. Hi, Parcasters. It's Ashley Flowers, and I'm exposing the most sinister cases from the darkest corners of the globe in my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, come along as I guide you on a wicked world tour. 15 different countries, 15 infamous crimes. Take a trip to Iceland where six people confessed to a murder that never actually happened. Journey to Mexico where a Lucha Libre wrestler moonlights as a serial killer. And travel to New Zealand where two friends hatch a deadly plan to become famous. Each episode of International Infamy explores the twists and turns of a notoriously high-profile case, zeroing in on the cultural details which make the crime unique to its location, and explaining why it couldn't have happened anywhere else. Follow my new Spotify original from ParCast, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers, and catch a new episode every week. Listen free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to the story. In December of 1980, 45-year-old Hulon Mitchell purchased a temple to house 50 of his 500 followers in the nation of Yahweh. It was referred to as the Temple of Love, but what went on inside the temple's walls was anything but loving. As Hulon increasingly sought control over every facet of his followers' lives, a few of them started to question his leadership. A small contingent of dissenting followers met regularly outside the temple to discuss their concerns. A few of them also began digging into their leader's shadowy past. What they found shocked them. The dissidents already suspected that Hulon was engaging in inappropriate sexual acts with many of the temple's female residents, including underage girls. When they discovered that he had left the Nation of Islam due to allegations of sexual impropriety, their fears were all but confirmed. Eric Burke, who had started the rebellion against Hulon, decided to take matters into his own hands. On November 10, 1981, he grabbed a pistol and drove to the temple to confront Hulon. As he pulled up to the temple, Eric jumped out of the car and waved the gun in front of the guards keeping watch outside. 
spraying bullets into the night sky, he called for Hulon to come outside and face him like a man. When Hulon didn't take the bait, Eric eventually got back in his car and went home. But Hulon wasn't going to let this slight go unpunished. That night, three of Hulon's enforcers from the Circle of Ten armed themselves with knives and headed to Eric's apartment. Eric knew they'd be coming. As the attackers came to his front door, he fired two warning shots from his window. Realizing the futility of bringing knives to a gunfight, the Nation of Yahweh men retreated to the temple. Although the attack had failed, Hulon's message was clear. Anyone who rose against him would be eliminated. However, not everyone heeded the warning. Two days later, on November 12th, Aston Green, known as Elijah to his nation of Yahweh brothers and sisters, came to the temple to try and extend an olive branch. Aston was roommates with Carlton Carey, who led the dissidents along with Eric Burke. Aston sympathized with Carlton's cause, but still had friends at the temple. He hoped he could bridge the divide between the two parties and help bring everyone back together. But the time for peace had passed. Aston was taken to a back room and beaten within an inch of his life. Hulon's enforcers wrapped Aston's bloody head in a carpet to soak up the blood and threw his limp body into the trunk of a car. He was still alive, just barely. But he wouldn't be for much longer. The men took him deep into the Everglades and did what Hulon said they should do to hypocrites like Aston. They cut off his head. Afterward, the Nation of Yahweh men returned to the temple, ready to celebrate their act of devotion. But the battle against the band of rebels was just getting started. When the police discovered Aston's remains the next morning, his roommate Carlton Carey told them that Hulon was responsible. He may not have struck the killing blow, but his enforcers had carried out the murder at his orders. And Hulon wasn't finished doling out punishment. When Carlton and his wife Mildred got home in the early hours of November 15th, four of the men who had cut off Aston's head were waiting for them, armed with guns and machetes. Carlton and Mildred had walked into an ambush. Carlton bought Mildred some time to flee, but it cost him his life. The Yahweh enforcers quickly overwhelmed him and shot him point-blank in the head. Mildred barely made it out of the front door before the enforcers got her, too. One of them grabbed Mildred and sliced her across the neck. Drawn to the commotion, one of Mildred's neighbors turned on their front light. Not wanting to risk exposure, the attackers ran into the darkness, leaving Mildred bleeding out on the ground. The neighbor quickly called the paramedics, and Mildred barely survived. After hearing what happened to his friends, Eric Burke went into hiding. His rebellion against Hulon was over. The police knew that Hulon was responsible for the attacks. But to put him behind bars, they had to overcome significant legal, religious, and cultural hurdles. When detectives came to the temple to question Hulon, he denied knowing anything about the murders. In fact, he took exception to their questions. If anything, he was the victim of racism and police persecution. When a Catholic died, people didn't blame the Pope. But because he was a black man trying to make an impact, Hulon was under suspicion. In the end, there was no real evidence tying Hulon to the murders. And nobody other than Mildred Banks was willing to testify against him. The police had to drop their investigation. Hulon and his devoted followers celebrated their victory. They rejoiced that the rebels, labeled Uncle Toms, had been vanquished. They crowed that they had risen above the laws of man to take holy vengeance on those who doubted Hulon's leadership. The followers who had stayed loyal to Hulon didn't believe they would ever suffer the same fate. Yes, he could be demanding. Yes, he could be harsh. But he had promised to take them to the promised land and they were determined to go with him. Freed from scrutiny inside and outside the nation of Yahweh, Hulon took steps to make his religion bigger and better. On Easter Sunday, 1982, 46-year-old Hulon sent 20 hand-picked elders all across the country to spread his word. 
Meanwhile, the nation of Yahweh in Miami continued to grow. Hulon established a clothing factory, a food distribution firm, and a housing company. He built a bottling plant that churned out a thousand bottles of Yahweh beer, wine, and soda every day. Searching for revenue streams to pay for these new investments, Hulon had many of his female followers apply for government welfare. By 1983, around 300 women handed their monthly welfare checks over to Hulon, providing him with up to $90,000 of monthly income. As the nation of Yahweh grew, Hulon lorded over his followers even more. Temple residents were fed only one daily meal of rice, cornbread, and water. Any members who didn't meet the monthly donation quota were sent to the temple's prayer room. They were forced to pray on their knees for hours and sometimes days. If their arms dropped or they tried to get up, a temple guard would strike them with a wooden rod. Hulon's increasingly dictatorial ways may have been a direct result of the unsuccessful rebellion against him. According to professors Seth David Norholm and Samuel Hunley of Emory University, after a negative evaluation, narcissistic people will demonstrate greater aggression even to individuals unrelated to the feedback. But word of Hulon's despotic rule never reached the public. To outside observers, the nation of Yahweh was dedicated to helping Miami's impoverished black community. Hulon was certainly a firebrand, but on the surface, it seemed like he was a true humanitarian. Hulon's positive press emboldened him. In the spring of 1984, 48-year-old Hulon told his followers that he had a new name. He was Yahweh Ben Yahweh, or God, the Son of God. He told them, I am heaven. I'm right in time, at the end of the white man's rulership, the beginning of your rulership. Hulon also announced that he was organizing a massive nationwide recruiting trip for the summer. In June of 1984, Hulon and the 200 followers now living in the temple left in a fleet of cars, trucks, and buses to embark on the 22-city tour. Led by Hulon's spotless white limousine, the caravan crisscrossed the country, raising money and attracting new followers. It was a massive success. By the time they returned to Miami in the fall of 1984, the nation of Yahweh had grown to more than 5,000 people nationwide. These new followers attended services at the extension temples Hulon's hand-picked elders had established throughout the country. Like the Miami-based followers, they were encouraged to donate as much of their money as possible. All donations were funneled to the main temple in Miami, where Hulon had direct control of the funds. But the new membership had come at a cost. The followers who accompanied Hulon on the tour were drained and exasperated. Each day they were required to solicit a minimum of $20 worth of donations. Those who didn't meet the quota were denied their meager daily meal of an apple, an orange, and a pear. Many were exhausted from subsisting in the inadequate living conditions. While the transport buses may have boasted gleaming exteriors, the interiors were crowded and dirty. Followers were forced to fight for room to sleep and had to wash themselves in rest stop bathrooms. Furthermore, the buses were constantly breaking down. In California, one bus drifted off the freeway, smashing into a light pole and killing three people. For many of the younger members of Hulon's congregation, the recruiting trip had been an eye-opening experience. The contrast between the freedom of the outside world and the oppression they faced within the nation of Yahweh had become all too clear. After the recruiting trip, a group of teenage followers started to secretly meet and discuss the abuses they suffered under Hulon. Many of the young women shared how Hulon forced them to have sex with him for years. He had been raping one of them since she was only ten and a half. Apparently, he had told her and the other girls that it was his job as God's messenger to teach women how to have sex. In exchange for weekly sex, he showered the girls with gifts and trips to posh hotels in South Beach. Starting in January 1985, many of these younger followers began to flee the temple and move in with non-Yahweh relatives. 
Their courage inspired older members of the congregation. One notable defector was Lloyd Clark, whose violent paddling had inspired the first rebellion against Hulon. But the biggest defection of all was from Hulon's own sister, Jean Solomon. For years, she'd been one of his most loyal followers. Ever since they were young, Jean had kept Hulon's secrets. But now, with rumors circulating that Hulon had slept with Jean's own daughter, she couldn't stand it anymore. In the summer of 1985, Jean and her daughter left the temple and never looked back. Unlike the first insurrection against him, there were too many defectors for Hulon's goons to track down. Slowly, word spread about the violence that lay behind the Temple of Love's spotless exterior. Hulon knew that if he wanted to keep control of his increasingly fragile empire, he had to take action. With violent retribution no longer possible, he needed a new way to silence the whispers about him. For this, Hulon had an ace up his billowing white sleeve. It was a tried and tested method of getting people to turn a blind eye to illicit and illegal activity. And in Miami, it was particularly effective. Hulon had money. And within the year, he'd have Miami's most renowned power brokers in his pocket. Coming up, Hulon tries to buy his way to respectability. But his lust for violence threatens to destroy everything he's built. And now, back to the story. After the massive recruitment drive in the summer of 1984, the nation of Yahweh's ranks were bigger than ever, with over 5,000 members spread across the country. 49-year-old Hulon Mitchell was at the peak of his powers. He had declared himself Yahweh Ben Yahweh, or God, Son of God. But Hulon's success came at a price. Having had a taste of the outside world during the recruitment tour, Many of his teenage followers realized that the abuse they suffered in the temple wasn't normal. After they left, they shared stories of the horrors they had endured at Hulon's hands. Hulon knew that if reports against him continued to come out, it would only be a matter of time until law enforcement descended on the temple. If he didn't take action, everything he had built could come crumbling down. But in Miami, if someone had deep enough pockets, they could get away with anything under the sun. And with money rolling in from his followers and various business ventures, Hulon's pockets were very deep. Starting in October of 1984, the nation of Yahweh bought apartment complexes and hotels in Miami's most crime-ridden neighborhoods. Just like with the dilapidated warehouse that eventually became the Temple of Love, each building received a major facelift. Painted in the Yahweh's signature blinding white, the new properties were a sign for criminals to stay far away. To protect his new investments, Hulon assigned guards to patrol the neighborhoods and chase off drug dealers and petty criminals. With crime rates plummeting, Hulon quickly ingratiated himself with local politicians. It was a win-win for both parties. Hulon snatched up properties at cut-rate prices, and the politicians claimed credit for improving their districts. By the fall of 1985, Hulon boasted to the Miami Herald that the nation of Yahweh controlled over $50 million in assets, nearly $120 million in today's dollars. In the span of a year, he had become one of the most powerful figures in Miami. He was untouchable. But as Hulon grew in power, he became more paranoid. According to Emory University's Seth David Norholm and Samuel Hunley, dictatorial leaders like Hulon tend to suffer from excessive anxiety, mostly regarding paranoid fears of uprising and or assassination. Considering the horrible abuses he inflicted upon his followers, it wasn't surprising that Hulon was concerned that they might turn against him. To combat his growing fears of enemies inside and outside the temple, Hulon created a select squad of bodyguards. Known as the Brotherhood, these bodyguards were a step above the Circle of Ten. The Brotherhood was made up of Hulon's most fanatical followers. In order to join, they had to be willing to execute all of his laws, literally. To show their unwavering loyalty, 
they had to kill a white man in Yahweh's name, and to prove they had done it, they were required to bring him the victim's ear. In April of 1986, police discovered the corpse of a white homeless man near the temple. Six weeks after that, a white gay couple were stabbed to death in their apartment. Soon, dead bodies started turning up all over Biscayne Boulevard. Many of them were missing an ear. Even as the body count rose, the police didn't connect the nation of Yahweh to the deaths. But while the local authorities were content to let Hulan literally get away with murder, the federal government wasn't so forgiving. In May of 1986, a month after these honor killings started, Lloyd Clark went to the FBI's office in South Beach. Over the course of four hours, he told Special Agent Herbert Cousins how he had gone from a vulnerable teenager searching for truth to a violent warrior willing to do anything for his messiah. But even with Lloyd's testimony, the FBI was powerless to move against Hulon. If they were going to take down the nation of Yahweh, they needed concrete evidence that Hulon was abusing his followers and ordering them to murder. As the FBI began to closely monitor Hulon's activities, it was still business as usual in the nation of Yahweh. Hulon had no idea he was under investigation. Buoyed by the support of Miami's most important power brokers, he continued spreading his influence across South Florida. In October 1986, the nation of Yahweh purchased an apartment complex called Dirt Road. Located in the Miami suburb of Opelaka, the Dirt Road apartments were a broken-down mess. Although single mothers on month-to-month -month leases rented most of the apartments, the complex was also a prime gathering point for drug dealers. Hulan was determined to rid his new property of any traces of criminal activity. If that meant the innocent became collateral damage, so be it. On the morning of October 28, 1986, over 150 of Hulan's white-robed followers arrived at the Dirt Road Apartments in an armada of buses. They went door to door, telling tenants that they had to pay their rent or face immediate eviction. Most of the residents refused to leave without an official eviction notice. The Yahweh's didn't care. They started clearing out empty apartments, regardless if they were actually vacated or if whoever lived there was just gone for the day. Despite the tenants' pleas for help, the police didn't do anything to stop the Yahweh's. Hulan and his followers had a track record of lowering crime rates, and the police were eager for them to bring order to a chaotic neighborhood. As the efforts to clear the dirt road apartments dragged on into the next day, Hulan grew impatient. On the night of October 29th, he sent the Brotherhood to the apartments. It was time to send his new tenants a message. At around 10 p.m., a green Plymouth pulled up to the Dirt Road Apartments. Two men stepped out. They were wearing street clothes, but the dozens of Yahweh guards stationed at the complex recognized them for what they were, Brotherhood enforcers. The Brotherhood men nodded to a couple white-robed guards. The guards then knocked on the apartment doors of two residents who were leading the resistance against being evicted. The guards lured the residents outside by claiming someone had hit their cars. Once they were out in the open courtyard, the guards forced the men to their knees. One of the Brotherhood enforcers then stepped out of the darkness and pressed a gun to one of the residents' heads. With Yahweh guards surrounding the complex, the other residents were powerless to come out and stop what was happening. In plain view, the Brotherhood enforcer pulled the trigger for all to see. The other man tried to run, but the Brotherhood Enforcer chased after him and tackled him to the ground. The resident was shot dead in the street. Though local police had tried to stay out of the situation due to Hulan's political connections, public executions were too much for them to ignore. At 1.42 a.m. on October 30th, 1986, the police apprehended Bobby Rozier, also known as Neoraya Israel. He had 22 caliber pistol cartridges in his pocket, and there were traces of blood on his jeans. Furthermore, once he was fingerprinted, Bobby was linked to almost all of the unsolved murders of the earless victims who appeared throughout Miami. The evidence against Bobby was overwhelming. 
prosecutors announced that they would seek the death penalty against him. Hulon quickly distanced himself from Bobby, claiming he was a rogue agent and had been acting on his own. He excommunicated Bobby from the nation of Yahweh and refused to provide him with any legal assistance. He told his followers that Bobby had threatened to reveal the nation's secrets if Hulon didn't provide him with a lawyer. Bobby had tried to extort him and had put his fellow followers at risk. By excommunicating Bobby, Hulon claimed he had saved them all. Hulon's followers celebrated the excommunication. They didn't stop to consider that Hulon had callously discarded one of his most loyal devotees. All that mattered was that Hulon had protected them. Bobby couldn't believe it. He had given Hulon his undying loyalty, and now he was being thrown to the wolves. In exchange for a milder sentence, he agreed to help prosecutors build a case against Hulon. Over the course of 100 hours worth of depositions, Bobby detailed his role in seven different murders. He claimed that Hulon had ordered six of them. Every story Bobby told matched up with an unsolved murder. As the federal government quietly built its case against Hulon, he continued to build his profile in Miami. As far as Hulon knew, the incident at the Dirt Road Apartments was only a small speed bump in his rise through Miami's power structure. By 1990, 55-year-old Hulon claimed that the nation of Yahweh controlled over $100 million in assets. He was so influential that Miami's mayor declared that October 7, 1990 would be Yahweh Ben Yahweh Day. Over 2,000 people gathered to celebrate Hulon's accomplishments. But Hulon had no idea that his reign would come to an end a month later. On November 6th, he flew to New Orleans to visit the local temple there. The FBI was right behind him. At 4.45 a.m. on November 7, 1990, Special Agent Herbert Cousins personally arrested Hulon in room 1450 of the Montleon Hotel. Much to Cousins' surprise, Hulon didn't put up any resistance. Meanwhile, the FBI executed a carefully planned raid on the Temple of Love in Miami. They were bracing for a deadly firefight, but when they knocked down the doors, there were only 15 terrified women and children inside. All the men were out on missions for Hulon. In four cities across the South, law enforcement officers arrested 17 more members of the Nation of Yahweh. They were suspected of committing crimes at Hulon's orders. Just like their leader, they put up no resistance. Even though Hulon never got his hands dirty, they had enough evidence to charge him with ordering crimes, including conspiracy to commit arson, extortion, and murder. If convicted on all counts, he could face 60 years in prison. The trial against Hulon and his followers began on January 2, 1992. The prosecution's star witness was Bobby Rozier. In graphic detail, Bobby described the six murders he had carried out at Hulon's request. However, during cross-examination, the defense showed that Bobby had lied about some of the details. For instance, he falsely claimed he'd seen Hulon personally cut off a victim's head. In total, the prosecution presented 60 witnesses over the course of eight weeks. Although the stories the witnesses presented were full of shocking details, the defense did its best to discredit them at every turn. Making matters more complicated, even though they were all on trial together, every one of Hulon's 16 followers had different lawyers and defense strategies. The attorneys tried as hard as possible to complicate the case and baffle jurors. By the time Hulon took the stand on April 21, 1992, the jurors' minds were reeling. The trial had been going on for over four months, and they could barely tell up from down. Throughout his two-day testimony and cross-examination, Hulon steadfastly maintained that he was innocent. Any of his followers who had committed crimes had done it of their own volition. The trial ended on May 23, 1992, the most substantial charge against Hulon was of criminal racketeering, which meant that he was accused of ordering multiple serious crimes. 
The standard of proof for such a crime was high, and the defense had confused the facts enough for it to be unclear if Hulon was guilty. Finally, on May 27th, the jury delivered its verdicts. Hulon was declared not guilty of racketeering. However, he and six of his followers were found guilty on lesser charges of conspiracy. In the end, they were sentenced to only 18 years in prison, less with good behavior. Although the state of Florida tried to bring its own separate charges against Hulon and his followers, the case never went anywhere. Hulon went to prison, ready to serve out his sentence. He fully intended to be released early for good behavior. If all went according to plan, he'd be out of prison in 2001 at the age of 66. He would resume leading the nation of Yahweh as though he'd never left. In the meantime, his followers tried to maintain his empire. But without Hulon's dominating personality, the movement rapidly shrank. The Temple of Love was abandoned, quickly reclaimed by the petty criminals and dope fiends who Hulon's followers had scared away. One by one, the nation of Yahweh's other properties were sold or abandoned. Many of Hulon's old allies in Miami turned on him, claiming they had no idea what he had been capable of. As his empire crumbled, Hulon's health withered away. He was released from prison in 2001, but was barred from reconnecting with his former followers. He returned to South Florida and toiled in obscurity as a landscaper. In 2006, 69-year-old Hulon was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He died a year later. Throughout his life, thousands of people had showered him with adulation, but in the end, he died alone. As of 2019, the nation of Yahweh is still in existence. It has tried to shed its image of an anti-white hate cult, but the organization is a shell of its former self. It's unknown how many followers the movement still has, or if it even has a formal leader. For those who survived Hulon's oppressive leadership, the scars still remain. Lloyd Clark, now known as Khalil Amani, continues to have nightmares about his time in the nation of Yahweh. Speaking to the Denver Post, he said, Sometimes I think Yahweh ben Yahweh has been resurrected and knocks on my front door. Sometimes I wonder, in the dream, maybe he really is God. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. We'll be back Tuesday with a new episode. For more information on Hulon Mitchell and the Nation of Yahweh, amongst the many sources we used, we found Sidney P. Friedberg's book, Brother Love, Murder, Money, and a Messiah, extremely helpful to our research. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday. You can find more episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows, on Spotify or your favorite podcast directory. Several of you have asked how to help us. If you enjoy this show, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. We'll see you next time. Cult was created by Max Cutler, is a production of Cutler Media, and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Dick Schroeder, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. This episode of Cults is written by Alex Benedon and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Hi, it's Vanessa from ParCast. If you enjoy our in-depth profiles on historical figures and famous fates, you'll love my new limited series, Obituaries. Every Wednesday on Spotify, join me and my co-host Carter as we explore the unlikely bonds forged between two meaningful figures from the past and discover how those relationships impacted the future. Follow the Spotify original from ParCast, Obituaries. Listen weekly, free and only on Spotify. Hi, listeners. It's Ashley Flowers, and here's a quick reminder to check out my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, I'm taking you across the globe to look at 15 of the most notorious crimes from 15 different countries. Some stories are sure to shock. Some may leave you stumped, but all are quite the trip. 
Follow my new series, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers. Listen for